Greetings everyone, Ryan here. And I wanted to wish all of you a very happy new year. We have big plans for Somewhere in the Skies in 2023, but we can't do it without your help. That's where Patreon comes in. And these are our newest patrons helping to support Somewhere in the Skies. Uria L, Dave R, Andrea B, Matt L, Todd M, Mark F, Tyler K, Yeon P, Sari N, Richard B, Jess T, Krista T, Jonathan M, Kent N, Nancy B, and Ted L. My special thanks to all of you, present, past, and future. If you'd like to help support the show, and in return get early editions of the main episode, bonus episodes, and priority to ask our guests your listener questions, consider becoming a Patreon subscriber today. To learn more and to subscribe, visit patreon.com slash somewhere skies. The A70 is a major road in Scotland. It runs a total of just about 120 kilometers, or 75 miles, from Edinburgh to Ayr. Much of the road is elevated, desolate moorland. It ascends several times on its course to heights over a thousand feet above sea level. In several areas of the road, it presents extensive views over central Scotland to the north. And while many travels have been taken up and down this often quiet country road, there was a traveler, or travelers, that may not have come from Scotland, the United Kingdom, Europe, or even from our world. And in 1992, two men driving down the A70 would learn this the hard way. This is the story of Gary Wood and Colin Wright, a Scottish UFO abduction. This is Somewhere in the Skies with Ryan Sprague. It was August 27th, 1992, at approximately 10 p.m. Gary Wood and Colin Wright were driving from south of Edinburgh on the A70 to the village of Terbrax in East Lothian. They were on their way to work a small appliance repair job. The journey across the A70 should have lasted a distance of about 15 miles and about 30 minutes. It wouldn't. Rounding a blind corner in vicinity of the Harperick Reservoir, Colin abruptly leaned forward, exclaiming to Gary, What the hell is that? Gary peered through the windshield. There, ahead of the car, floating about 20 feet above the road, was a two-tiered, disc-shaped object, about 30 feet wide and much, much wider than the road. The object was smooth, black, and shiny, with no windows or illumination. Both of the men, completely awestruck with what they were witnessing in front of them, and absolutely terrified, wanted to get away as soon as possible. As their vehicle passed beneath the craft, a sudden shimmer of light descended on the car. Soon, the men were enveloped in total darkness as they both lost consciousness. When they next came to their senses, they were startled to find themselves still in the car as it veered out of control off the side of the road to come to a stop. Both men would eventually admit that they thought they had died. But as they sat there, alive, and tried to figure out just what happened, they started to slowly pull themselves together. 
and continued on their way in a very confused state. When they reached their destination, they were in for another shock when they looked at the time and saw that a full two hours had passed, which was impossible because it was typically only about a 30 minute drive. They could not figure out where the missing time had gone, no matter how hard they tried, and they both agreed that the only thing they could remember was that strange black disc and its glimmering wall of light. They tried to rationalize it as tiredness and put it out of their minds, but things were about to get much stranger. The following day, Gary woke to find himself completely fatigued with barely even the energy to get out of bed. His entire body felt heavy, and this continued on for the next few days, along with nightmares that he could not remember when waking. Additionally, he began getting strong migraine headaches, and thinking that there was something seriously wrong with him. He would eventually consult his doctor, and was advised to have an MRI scan, which proved negative. As an additional precaution, he underwent the uncomfortable procedure of a spinal tap. But once again, nothing specific was discovered or diagnosed. This is when Gary began to suspect that his physical condition was somehow related to the strange experience he and Colin had out on that lonely stretch of road. He thought that maybe there was something hidden in those two hours of missing time as well. This is when Gary decided to get in touch with a prominent UFO researcher in Scotland. My name is Malcolm Robinson and I am the founder of Scottish UFO and Paranormal Research Group, Strange Phenomena Investigations. I founded SPI way back in 1979 and I initially set out to disprove subjects such as UFOs, ghosts and poltergeists as I honestly felt that there were no validity to these claims. <laughs> but how wrong was I? As I travelled on my UFO and paranormal quest, I soon realised that these things were real and demanded serious investigation. Seeking some sort of answers to what may have possibly happened, Malcolm made a suggestion on how Gary and Colin should move forward. I first became involved with the A-70 UFO incident when one of the witnesses, Gary Wood, telephoned me at home to inform me that both he and his friend Colin Wright had had a strange experience on the A-70 road. My initial thoughts after hearing what Gary had to tell me was that this case could possibly be head and shoulders above anything else that I've dealt with before. At this point in my career, I advocated the use of hypnotic regression as a tool to perhaps, and it's a big perhaps, extract any possible hidden subconscious memory of something else that may have happened that night. I asked if Gary and Colin would like to try it, to which Gary replied most certainly, as he really needed to know what happened to him as even his wife and friends did not believe him. He knew, deep down, that something else happened that night. Colin, too, was happy to go under regressive hypnosis. When I got both men to my home, which at that point was in the small town of Tullabuddy in Clackmannanshire in central Scotland, I could see that they both were very troubled at what they had gone through and that they both were looking for answers as to what had happened to them. I've dealt with hundreds of witnesses over 45 years, and uh, you do get a feeling of who is telling the truth as they see it, as opposed to those who are looking to pull the wool over your eyes. Both men for me were, were as honest as the day was long, and this impression has remained with me until today, over 30 years later. While early hypnotic regression sessions yielded panicked emotions by both men, and scattered and fractured images and memories, gradually a clearer picture began to come into focus. A picture that would only lead to more questions than answers about what had occurred on the A-70 road that night. 
Under separate hypnotic regressions, both men claimed that after being hit with a curtain of light, their car had died on the spot, after which they had been approached by small humanoid creatures, three to each side, which opened the doors of the vehicle and put them onto two stretcher-like objects that hovered over the ground. As this was happening, the men had been paralyzed, their bodies racked with pain and convulsing as if they were receiving an electrical shock. Gary would later state of his recollections the following. I saw the three creatures coming towards my car. I felt intense pain, like an electric shock. Then I was in some room. I saw these things, like wee men moving about, doing something to me. I could only see up. Then this six foot tall creature approached. It was white grey in colour with a large head and dark eyes with a long slender neck. Very slim shoulders and waist. There were either ribs or folds of skin on its body. The arms were like ours, but there were four very long fingers. The little ones were about three foot tall and seemed to do all the work while the big ones did the communication. After this, Gary's memories remained murky at first. But Colin was able to remember being led into a circular corridor filled with a dazzling bright light, which was sterile and featureless save for a strange curved chair described as being almost organic in shape. He was led to the chair by one of these entities, and then stripped naked and made to sit, after which he underwent an intrusive physical examination. Colin also remembered lying back in the chair and looking at the ceiling. It was corrugated, translucent, and there was soft, diffused lighting filtering through. This memory segued seamlessly into being naked in a transparent container, made from material rather like glass. He had straps at the feet and ankles securing him. Outside the container, he could clearly see other men and women, all naked and all in transparent containers. Blowing around the outside of these containers was a mist rather like a fog. Colin also saw a number of tall humanoid creatures, one of which was standing framed in a doorway opposite him, and another three were approaching the container in which he was imprisoned. Abruptly, the transparent material of his container began to frost up. Colin became alarmed and began to weep. Suddenly, the frosting began to retreat, almost like a film strip running in reverse, until the material was once again perfectly clear. Colin nervously watched as an angular device rose from the floor. It was long and thin like a rod, with a small triangular head. Two glowing red lights were set into one of the sides. There was a peculiar appendage about halfway along the length of the device, and the base was jointed at the floor. The entire machine moved up and down continuously and the appendage swung from left to right. Although there was no pain, Colin thought it might be scanning him. The examination seemed to be mostly harmless and non-invasive at first, but this would change when another device approached his eye and begin some sort of frightening procedure. Colin would state the following, under hypnosis, of his surreal experience at the time. Something's in my eye. I don't know. It's uncomfortable. Like a red hot poker in the center of my eye. It's really sore. I can't see anything with that eye. I'm trying to get a good look at the thing. The thing that's doing this to me. It's just took out of my eye. My right eye is really burning. My eye is really watering. It's gushing. It felt like there was something clamped on it. That there was something going into my eye. Something's looking at me in the corridor. It's, it was, ah, it's ugly. It's ugly and it's lurking in that corridor. It, it comes and goes. It, it seems ancient to me, ugly. It's really badly deformed. I'm not scared of it anymore. It seems that this thing's been in a fight and it's the loser. I think it's trying to manipulate me. I don't know. I think I'm pissing it off. Because I'm not scared anymore. I'm laughing at it. It's weird. It's a way. I can hear a noise behind me. Can't think of a word to describe it. 
I'm staring at a wee one, a wee creature. It's not very happy with me. I don't think I was supposed to look behind my chair for some reason. It's looking at me with those black eyes. But I'll not give in. It's trying to outstare me. It's a way. I don't think it was very pleased with me. It just doesn't want me to see what is behind me for some reason. If I try to do anything, they'll come in the corner and they'll stop me. I keep wanting to get out of this chair, but I bet it'll be a big mistake. As Gary's own hypnosis sessions continued, his memory gradually became sharper, and he largely described the same sort of experience as Colin. In his case, he remembered waking up on a flat table with some sort of black lens-shaped device that was twisting and turning in the center of the room, making a whooshing noise. As he looked around the otherwise featureless room, a long, thin, translucent arm then extended over his chest towards his head, after which it suddenly dropped right onto his chest. While this was going on, there was a strange buzzing noise pervading his skull, and he felt that he was being watched and studied by an object on the wall. Later, Gary would recount the following. It was buzzing, like interference. There was a sting on the other side, like a flap, and there were two eyes on it. In this place, there was an object up on the wall and it was watching me. It was something horrible. I didn't know what it was. Eye, yes, the black lens thing. About seven feet wide and it, it was a shape of a black eye. And there were four packs. They were like, you know how you get a box of chocolates and some have lines on them? They were like that. They were making this object fold in on itself like a black liquid and it would start spinning around and making a whooshing noise. It was like it was all off balance. Then spot on, like it was running perfect. They turned me around again and there was a circular hole in the floor. There was a gel-like substance, like wallpaper paste, a clear gel, and I saw something moving in it. One of these creatures climbed out of the gel. At this point, I jumped out of the hypnosis. Now, some of these creatures looked like they were bruised and had to be in this gel stuff. I was taken to this place and I saw these things. I saw these things like they were really, really thin and they had a funny shaped head and there were lots of them. They kept coming towards me, bending on themselves and going away. Now this place I was in, it was like a red mist and these things were swimming in the red mist and all these things kept coming, big ones and wee ones. And they were all looking at me, they would fall back on themselves and head away. I think these things, you know how you get tadpoles and frogs, they were like that. In all, Gary remembers there being around 20 or 30 creatures present, the majority tall, pallid, grey colour and frail looking. One notable variation from this was a smaller, rather bizarre looking being with an odd heart-shaped face. On its face were some strangely familiar markings. These comprised coloured facial stripes, three diagonally on each cheek almost reminiscent of tribal markings normally associated with members of Native American tribes. He looked at the creatures and mentally asked, why are you doing this? The answer that appeared in his mind was surprising and a little disturbing. It was one word, sanctuary. While he was in telepathic communication with this creature, he was able to see fragments of its existence as if the process was a two-way street. The creature found this amusing, but could not prevent it. In a further mental communication, the being said, In many ways, you are more advanced than us, but you have been capped. Our existence is much like your own. We also have concerns and needs. So what did this creature mean by capped? Could they have meant that our development, either psychologically or physically or both, had been deliberately slowed down? Were we likely to present a threat to someone, or were we perhaps too immature to deal with the responsibility that our development would bring? These were many of the questions that Gary asked himself about what it meant to be capped. Gary would also remember other bits and pieces from his ordeal although he wasn't sure of the exact order of events. On one occasion, he would claim that he had been in some sort of stone chamber with tunnels leading off into the darkness. He also remembered seeing a crying, panicked, and 
disheveled human woman sitting on the floor sobbing as one of these entities stood next to her. The next thing he remembers is being dragged back to the car and blacking out, after which he awoke to find Colin in the car with him. Colin, under hypnosis, would state the following. There is a big alien in front of me doing something. My head is pounding. I don't know if it's giving me something or taking something out of my head. My mind goes black. Then later, my head feels numb. It feels massive. It feels as if I've got a big forehead. Shooting pain. I don't know what they have done, but it's weird. My brain feels like it's swollen and pushing my head out like it's going to burst. I can't handle this. It stopped. It's weird. Big bang and a thud. Then I'm back on the road. Gary's looking at me. He's bewildered. Gary's asking me, did you see what I saw? As soon as both men gathered their wits about them, they took a look at the car and the area around it and found things from the vehicle strewn about. They would also notice a strange white material all over the car that seemed to appear out of nowhere. Gary would state the following about all of this. After what happened, Colin and I went back looking in the area and found stuff that had been in the car. Dusters, rags and bits and pieces. As if someone had been raking around in the car. After this, my car started growing a white dust all over it. You know the kind of thing that develops on battery terminals like crystallisation but all over the car. I was always at the car removing this growth, rubbing down the paintwork and repainting it. I couldn't understand it. I know cars, it's my job, I'm an ambulance mechanic. I tried everything but it made no difference. Inside the boot, it was everywhere, this white crystallisation. When the story of the A70 incident got out to the public, due in part to Malcolm Robinson, it became a huge story not only in Scotland, but gradually it began to make headlines across the entire world. Many would dismiss it as yet another fanciful story made up by two men with nothing better to do. However, others believed this was a genuine case of alien abduction, but for most, they teetered on the fence, not exactly sure what to believe. So what was some of the most convincing evidence from this case? Malcolm Robinson believed the following. The key pieces of evidence were things that did not conform to other worldwide UFO abduction tales. And I refer to those creatures having red, green and yellow markings under their large black eyes. Now, this is not consistent with other worldwide UFO reports. Some of these creatures had what appeared to be heavy, rolled up segments of skin on their stomachs, which again is unusual. Both men came back from this incident with scars on their body, which previously were not there. And the journey from Edinburgh to Terbrax should only have taken them around 35 minutes. But when they arrived at Terbrax, they found much to their astonishment that the journey had taken well over an hour. So, a period of missing time was unaccounted for. Both men prior to this encounter did not have any interest in matters pertaining to UFOs and aliens. aliens. Yes, they had heard about them, as we all have, through TV and radio, but it was not a big thing in their life. For me, this case is real. By God, it happened. I have not once changed my opinion on this case. Having met the men many times, my conviction is that they are telling the truth. This case plays a massive role in Scottish ufology. It shows that Scotland as a nation has also been touched by the UFO presence. Let us not forget that there were a number of other experiences of which Gary had to endure, namely a small grey appearing suddenly in his bedroom and on another occasion, a white mist enveloped his car one day as he was driving himself and his two young sons on another desolate stretch of road. As it stands, this is Scotland's first officially reported UFO abduction. 
This incident is real and I'm convinced that it happened in the way that both witnesses described it. No matter the case, the A-70 UFO abduction remains one of the most compelling accounts of alien abduction to come out of Scotland. In fact, it was recently discovered that there were once classified files on this incident within the Ministry of Defense, which were recently made public within the National Archives, prompting many to believe that the British government did indeed take this case seriously enough to put it on record. No matter what did or didn't happen on the A-70, a dark, lonely road that night, it remains a deeply bizarre addition to UFO history, and, like most UFO cases, remains a mystery with answers that may lay somewhere in the skies. Couldn't get enough of Scottish UFOs this week? Well, fear not. We have a special bonus episode waiting for you over at Patreon. In 1979, in the Denchmont Woods area near Livingston, Scotland, Robert Taylor would claim to have encountered beings from another world. And it would be the only case in all of Scotland where a UFO would become part of a criminal investigation. Hear the story of the Denchmont Woods encounter of Robert Taylor, waiting for you over on Patreon. Visit patreon.com slash somewhere skies. Special thanks to our voiceover talent in this episode, to Andy McGrillen and Mick Ford. Links to their Twitter accounts can be found in the show notes. Special thanks also to Brent Swanser, Brian Allen, and Malcolm Robinson for additional research on this episode. Additional coverage and updates on the A-70 UFO case can be read in Malcolm Robinson's book, The A-70 UFO Incident, available on Amazon. Link in the show notes. If you haven't, please take a moment to subscribe, follow, rate, and review Somewhere in the Skies on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get the show. We're on Twitter at Somewhere Skies and Instagram at Somewhere Skies Pod. Links to our merch store, articles, and books can all be found in the show notes. Thank you so much for listening. And remember, keep your feet on the ground, but never stop searching somewhere in the skies. Somewhere in the Skies is produced by Third Kind Productions in association with the Entertainment One Podcast Network.